Okay, so today we're going to do another question and make sure if you do have any questions, go ahead and leave them in the comments and I may select it for next week's video. So today's question comes from James Hampton. He says, can you please tell us how to be safe when it comes to making sites hack free? I don't just mean writing bad or correct code. I mean, as far as anything else you can think of. I am just beginning to learn to write code for the web, but I'm wondering how to make sure my websites are not unsafe. If I upload the site files to a host for a client, everything should be safe, right? As long as I didn't write incorrect code, what do I need to be concerned with? Well, James, this is actually an amazingly important question. And honestly, information security is a massive topic and I can't even really just begin to get started on all of the things involved with it. But what I am gonna do is kind of touch on a few topics that you guys can get a little bit familiar with and hopefully it opens your eyes to a little bit more of the broad ideas within information security. What he's basically asking is how do I keep my website safe? In essence, I believe what he's really saying is he doesn't understand what sort of things that he needs to be protecting his website against. So I'm going to go over three of the most common website attacks that are common today. Now there's a ton of these, but I'm just going to go over three of them today and I'm going to give you guys resources to do more research on your own. So here's a list of uh, some pretty common ones. As you can see, this is a pretty long list and these are just common ones. There's so many. And honestly, we don't know all of the vulnerabilities that exist. And what I mean by that is people are still finding new ways to attack websites and attack web applications in general. So this is not a topic where you're going to just be able to study it and know all of the different possibilities. It's a very complex subject and constantly every day new vulnerabilities are being found. So really the worst vulnerabilities are the ones that don't exist yet or haven't been thought of yet. And these are actually called zero day vulnerabilities. And what that basically means is that it hasn't existed until right now. So someone just thought of it. They just found a vulnerability in a website and they attack instantly. And the reason why this is so dangerous is because you have no defenses for it. It doesn't exist yet. So you have no way of knowing or anticipating it. So a zero day vulnerability is by far the most dangerous and we have no idea how many there are out there. So not to scare you or anything, I just wanted to go over the fact that even the most popular websites like Facebook, Twitter, even YouTube are vulnerable to attacks, even the most common ones. And these websites are constantly battling hackers and constantly just dealing with different types of vulnerabilities all of the time. So it's really something that I think all developers should be aware of, but also understand that no matter what you do, you're going to be vulnerable when you create a web application and put it on the internet. Now, luckily there's a lot of services and also a lot of frameworks that handle these vulnerabilities for you but it's still really important to be educated as a developer on these vulnerabilities because they may be able to bypass that or you know you just generally need to understand these things these are very important to understand as a developer and i think it's really underrated and i've worked with a lot of developers who simply just are not very informed with information security in general so this is something you really want to add to your tool set you don't have to spend too much time on it just make sure you put some time into studying information security and I'm gonna go ahead and get started on talking about the three vulnerabilities that I want to focus on today. So the three that I wanna focus on today is gonna to be cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, and SQL injection. Now you've probably heard of at least one of these, but I'm gonna go into detail on what these are and how to prevent them. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is cross-site request forgery. The definition is kind of diluted, so I'm gonna to try to make this as simple as possible for you to understand. If you can imagine a form submission, so on your website you have a form that can be submitted. There is a URL that you can use that goes directly to that form submission. That's why when you when you submit a form and you're on the success screen and you click back, you'll often see a little pop up if you're using Google Chrome or something that says, do you want to confirm form submission? It's because that URL is what is used to submit the form itself when using the default form behavior in HTML. So with that being said, you can create a hyperlink where when you click it, it actually submits that form. And inside of the hyperlink, inside of that URL is all of the parameters used to populate the form inputs. So what a attacker could do, for instance, in an example that, um, that I will use here is if you wanna do a bank transfer, 
and you submit the bank transfer using a form, you can create a hyperlink where you put the dollar amount and your own banking account number, give that link to someone, uh, send it to uh, them in an email, trick them into clicking that link. And if they're already authenticated on the website, like they already have a JWT token or a cookie where they're already authenticated on the website and they click that, it's gonna submit the form and transfer the money to that person instantly. So that link is for the form submission and you basically use social engineering to get someone to click on it who's already authenticated on that website and it submits the form with whatever information the attacker puts inside of that URL. Um, how do you prevent that? Well, the most common way is to generate a token. So when you visit the website, you generate a token for the user. You store it inside of a cookie. And every single time the user submits a form, they have to have that generated token or else the form submission will fail. When the user creates the hyperlink, when you click that, that's for the form submission, and it doesn't have that token inside of it, it will fail. So that is the most common method that people use to prevent that. And most most frameworks already have that sort of thing built into them, so you don't have to typically worry about that, but you still definitely want to understand how that works and be able to prevent that. Another way that that's preventable is by creating your own form behavior. And what I mean by that is, let's say you're using a front-end web application framework like React, and instead of using form tags with the default form submission behavior, you actually grab the data from the inputs manually, and when the user clicks the submit button, you do stuff with that instead of just relying on the default form behavior. That's just multiple ways you can prevent it or just start to get into the mindset of thinking about how to prevent Prevent these things. I like the way that the blog Coding Horror states it. He says, they say, the key to understanding CSRF attacks is to recognize that websites typically do not verify that a request came from an authorized user. Instead, they verify only that the request came from the browser of an authorized user. Another very common type of attack, and one of the most discussed, is called SQL injection. And SQL, if you don't know, is a query language for databases. It's probably the most common database querying language out there. The SQL injection, basically the idea is you can inject SQL lines of SQL code into a form, submit it, and basically run that code in the actual database itself. So one example would be, let's say you want to get all of the information out of the database of all of the users on a particular website. Well, if they don't have their stuff set up properly to protect against SQL injection, you could just go and submit lines of SQL code that grabs that information out of the database and it will return the entire raw data from the database. And one way to prevent that, and the most common way, and maybe the only way is input validation and something called parameterized queries. Now, input validation is pretty simple. Um, validate that whatever the user is typing into that input is what you would be expecting. So if they're typing SQL quote code and they click submit, you know, you don't want to submit that. So <laughs> front end validation is very important there and make sure you validate that input on the back end as well. And parameterized queries is the idea that you create a SQL string. So Think of the SQL line of code as a string, and when the user um, or when the app in general needs to perform a query using SQL, instead of just sending that, um, that line of code out to the database, all you're doing is taking variables, injecting them into the already created SQL string, and then using that as the SQL code that gets run. So I'm just gonna read the formal definition off of Stack Overflow on what is a parameterized query, just because my personal definition might not do it for some people, so I just wanna make sure that this is as clear as possible. A parameterized query is a means of pre-compiling a SQL statement so that all you need to supply are the parameters, think variables, that need to be inserted into a statement for it to be executed. It's commonly used as a means to preventing SQL injection attacks. So that is SQL injection. Now let's move on to the next one. So the last one I wanna talk about today is going to be cross-site scripting. And you can kind of think of this as a way that an attacker can get malicious code to run in your browser. Say you're the victim here and there's an attacker out there. His goal is to get malicious, essentially JavaScript code to run inside of your browser to make something happen. So one simple example of this would be, let's just say there's a social media website and it allows you to edit your bio. And this particular website did not set up the protection against this and just does not sanitize the inputs. And let's say an attacker goes in and submits their bio, but instead of putting an actual bio, they submit JavaScript code. And that JavaScript code ends up getting stored in the database. 
And whenever a different user goes and looks at that bio, the request sends a it sends a request to the the database and it comes back with that javascript code which then runs in the browser and can be malicious and you know if you're already authenticated you don't know what's going to happen you know that code can do whatever so that's just one example of cross site scripting there's many different types but i'm just trying to get you guys to understand what types of attacks are out there so you can kind of start researching on your own so again there's tons of different of types of attacks out there and there's no way that you're going to be secure against all of them but it's important to be educated and understand that these attacks exist. I would say spend a little bit of time researching the different types of attacks that are out there and how to keep your website safe. Now, one of the parts of the question was, if I upload the site files to a host for a client, everything should be safe, right? As long as I didn't write the incorrect code. So writing the incorrect code is one part of it, but also you have to understand that there's server attacks too, such as DDoS attacks and just so much more. So just being aware of these things will be very helpful for you. And even though the hosting website will most likely take care of attacks such as DDoS attacks, you still want to understand that they exist because if somehow they bypass it and your website does get attacked, at least you'll understand what's happening and you may be able to solve that more quickly. So I hope that that helps you guys understand what sort of attacks are out there, how, you know, the basics of information security with front end web development. And I highly recommend you take some time to research information security as a whole and just, you know, go on YouTube, find a tutorial series or just a playlist that talks about different topics. Um, one of my favorites is Computer File. They actually have tons of videos on this and I will leave a link in the description. Also, one good resource is to just go out there and get your Security Plus certification. Even if you're not gonna work in the field, it's good to just have all of that knowledge. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, give me a like, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next video.